Hello and welcome to the 19th annual Martin Luther King Jr. Freedom Breakfast and President's Fulfilling the Dream Award program. I am Michelle Cook, Vice Provost for Diversity and Inclusion and Strategic University Initiatives here at the University of Georgia. Thank you for joining us today as we celebrate the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Our 2022 theme, The Power of the Dream, Footsteps of Courage, is a reminder that no measure of distance nor time can alter our course towards a more equitable and inclusive culture. Together, we're working towards the society that Dr. King imagined. As we reflect on the life and legacy of Dr. King, we contemplate his profound vision of a peaceful tomorrow, a society in which justice and compassion are the driving forces in our schools, our courts, and our communities, a vision which resonates with us today. As Dr. King once said, courage is an inner resolution to go forward despite obstacles. That is what brings us together and the purpose of this program. Recognizing Dr. King's determination for change through the invaluable work of individuals and their contributions to civil rights and racial justice. I hope this program inspires conversation and connections that not only inform our community, but also our humanity. As we commemorate the progress we have made toward realizing Dr. King's dream, I would like to thank all of you watching this program for your role in moving us forward. The steps we have made are making this very moment and will continue to make are the steps that will lead into a brighter, more just, and more inclusive future. Enjoy the program, The Power of the Dream, Footsteps of Courage. Good morning and welcome to this year's Martin Luther King Jr. Freedom Breakfast Celebration. This special event reinforces our commitment to honoring the legacy of Dr. King and those who continue to follow in his footsteps. Dr. King remains one of the world's most influential leaders and a champion for justice and equality whose legacy continues to inspire us all. As we honor King's legacy, we are also here to celebrate the great leaders among us, those who have worked to make King's dream a reality. Allow me to take this opportunity to extend a congratulations to all of the recipients of the Fulfilling the Dream Award. Your work on our campus and in our local community is an important part of the work that we do at UGA and in the Classic City. Today, we have the opportunity to hear from a former member of the UGA community and veteran education administrator, Dr. Art Dunning. 
Dr. Dunning has had an impactful career in higher education, including his time at UGA, where he served as the Vice President for Public Service and Outreach, and was instrumental in the development of our Archway Partnership. Dr. Dunning, on behalf of the entire university community, I thank you for taking time to be with us today and for all that you have done for this institution, for our state, and the field of higher education throughout the years. We look forward to your remarks this morning, even though you graduated from the University of Alabama. You're still welcome to celebrate our recent national championship with us. Allow me also to extend my gratitude to our local partners, the Clark County School District and the athens Clark County government. I appreciate your ongoing support of this important annual event that is a great example of community partnership between each of our organizations. And I would be remiss if I did not extend a special thanks to Dr. Michelle Cook, who leads our campus efforts for diversity, inclusion, and strategic university initiatives. Dr. Cook and her hardworking team do so much to make this breakfast a great success every year, and we greatly appreciate all that you do. Thank you so much to all of you for joining us and making this celebration one that honors not only Dr. King, but the collective work towards becoming a nation that he dreamed we would be. Thank you. Good morning. I bring greetings on behalf of the Unified Government of athens Clark County. We are grateful to be part of this fantastic event year in and year out. And we appreciate all the work that the recipients here today have done to honor King's dream. A theme of this event is courage. And of course, King was a courageous individual. From his early work in Birmingham and Albany, to his later advocacy for peace amidst the Vietnam War, and advocacy for workers' rights approaching his death in Memphis, King didn't rest on his laurels, but he sought ever greater opportunity to understand the needs of his community and of the planet. And I ask for each and every one of us that we call upon the spirit in our own work in our time ahead. Good morning. My name is Lawrence Harris, and I'm honored to be with you today as the Chief of Community Engagement and Strategic Partnerships with the Clark County School District. Every year, our students participate in a district-wide art competition designed to provide education connections to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s legacy. His legacy of, of courage, his legacy of freedom, and his legacy of equality and equity for all. We are happy to share this video of students showcasing their art explaining how they interpreted Footsteps of Courage. Their inspired message of hope, along with some sage advice, will resonate with all of us. On behalf of the school district, I would like to say thank you to the University of Georgia and the athens Clark County community for supporting us, our students, and our schools. As our superintendent says, we are truly better together. Dr. Martin Luther King was a man who fought for civil justice. He was an activist who fought for equality and freedom. He was someone that helped everyone be able to have the same opportunities. Martin Luther King taught me how to bring love and peace and joy to people. Martin Luther King has taught me to you can be friends with anybody even if you're a different race. He wanted to make a right to make a difference in the world. He taught me that he could bring hope and peace and love to everybody. 
He taught me that you should treat people all the same, no matter their race or gender. We should work together to make this world better. Don't always think of yourself. Think of people around you. Some of my best friends do not look like me, yet they are still my friends. When we work together, we can do great things for each other. I decided to draw this piece of art to show others the true meaning of unity. The picture I drew shows that it does not matter the color of your skin, we need peace and hope for all. I wanted to make this to maybe, you know, like encourage people to live greener and unite. I wanted to show the world that under our skin we're all human. You can be friends with anyone. MLK was somebody who changed the world in a way that will never be forgotten. Good morning. My name is Alton Standifer, and I have the pleasure of introducing the recipients of the 2022 President's Fulfilling the Dream Award. The President's Fulfilling the Dream Award highlights the work of UGA faculty, staff, students, and local community members who have made significant contributions to justice, race relations, and human rights. Our award winners have demonstrated a commitment to the athens Clark County community, the Clark County School District, and the University of Georgia through their civic engagement by utilizing King's philosophy to resolve conflict and foster goodwill. Our first award is presented to Mr. Kevin Nwogu. Hailing from Stone Mountain, Georgia, Kevin is pursuing a BBA in management from the Terry College of Business and a minor in Student Affairs Leadership. Throughout his time at UGA, Kevin has been committed to serving others. There is no greater example of this than the scholarship he created for servant leaders at his high school. Kevin has also served as an orientation leader, a game ambassador, and is the current president of the Student Alumni Council. Being a leader is a selfless job. Dr. King himself said everybody can be great because everybody can serve. Kevin, we're so excited to see what the future holds for you. We know that it will be great because you have rooted everything you do in service to others. Thank you for your humility, for your kindness, your service, and your love of the University of Georgia. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in congratulating Mr. Kevin Nwogu. One of my favorite messages from Dr. King is that life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? I've always been taught that it's not enough that I succeed on my own. I must look to my left, my right, my front, and my back and try to figure out how I can help others. We all have the capacity to serve, whether that's with our time, our talents, our listening ears or our loving hearts. And throughout my time at the university, I have done my best to learn from my peers, to serve them, and to really just find ways where I can grow and thrive and become the best young man that I am today. It is an honor to be a recipient of the MLK Fulfilling the Dream Award. Next, we have Mr. Carl Miller. Carl is a PhD student in the Learning, Leadership, and Organizational Development Program and serves as a graduate assistant in the Office of Institutional Diversity. Carl graduated from Savannah State University with a Bachelor of Arts in English Language and Literature and received his Master's in Professional Communication and Leadership from Georgia Southern University. A few of Carl's research interests include organizational development and change, black male leadership development, and justice-oriented education. One would describe Carl as a giver. He has given up his time, talent, and treasure to local groups such as the Athens Area Homeless Shelter, students in the Clark County School District, the Boys and Girls Club, and the Athens YMCA. Carl, you show your commitment to communities across this state 
through your selflessness and willingness to always put others ahead of yourself. It is this service that has led you to being recognized as Volunteer of the Year by the United Way, Citizen of the Year by Omega Sci-Fi Fraternity Incorporated, as well as a Goodwill Ambassador and Outstanding Georgia Citizen by the Secretary of State in 2017. I am so pleased that we are able to recognize your contributions to our community with the President's Fulfilling the Dream Award. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in congratulating Mr. Carl Miller. To me, fulfilling the dream is about building bridges. It's about helping people get from where they are to where they need to be. I'm reminded of the story of the bridge builder, an old man gone on a lone highway, who came at the evening cold and gray, to a chasm vast and wide and steep, with waters rolling cold and deep. The old man crossed in the twilight dim. The sullen streams had no fears for him, but he turned when safe on the other side and built a bridge to span the tide. Old man said a fellow pilgrim near, you're wasting your strength with building here. Your journey will end with the ending day. You never again must pass this way. You've crossed the chasm deep and wide. Why build you this bridge at the even tide? The builder then lifted his old gray head. Good friend in the path I have come, he said. There followeth after me today, a youth whose feet must pass this way. And that chasm that was as naught to me, to that fair haired youth may a pitfall be. He too must cross in the twilight dim. Good friend, I am building this bridge for him. And just like that bridge builder, just like Dr. King, I too seek to build bridges to help bring to reality the beloved community. Dr. Henry Young currently serves as the department head for clinical and administrative pharmacy within the UGA College of Pharmacy. He has been a strong figure, not only in our campus community, but also across our state through his partnership with the Public Service and Outreach Division. As a scholar, Dr. Young's work focuses on provision of health care for all citizens, especially minorities and the underrepresented. He was recently awarded a $900,000 USDA grant to develop a telemedicine program for rural Georgia citizens. Dr. Young has a long list of accomplishments and recognitions including his service on the Presidential Task Force on Race, Ethnicity, and Community, and his prior role as president of the Black Faculty and Staff Organization. However, one of his most inspiring achievements is the creation of Fishers of Men, a group of church leaders in Pulaski County who serve as outreach ambassadors to encourage men to take ownership of their own health, and wellness. Dr. Young, your positive impact on black men at the University of Georgia could not be overstated. When I say that, know that I mean that impact goes beyond just our undergraduate students. It reaches to graduate students and your colleagues in the academy as well. Whether you're making jokes with the brothers during a Tuesday lunch at the Georgia Center or outshining all of us on the golf course, as a member of this community that you've had a positive impact on, I want you to know one thing, and that is that you are appreciated. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in congratulating Dr. Henry Young. Of all the forms of inequality, injustice in health is the most shocking and inhuman. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. made this poignant statement in 1966. And while we have made great inroads in the provision of health care for all of our citizens, 55 years later, we still have much work to do. My work and research here at the University of Georgia has given me the privilege of working with community members to help them engage with one another and collaborate with healthcare providers to work towards better health outcomes. I am extremely grateful to UGA, President Moorhead, and the President's Fulfilling the Dream Award Committee for the recognition of this work. From the bottom of my heart, I thank you. Next, 
we have Ms. Rosa Driggers. For the last 11 years, Rosa has served in the Office of Undergraduate Admissions, currently holding the role of Associate Director of Admissions for Access and Inclusion. She is recognized across campus as an outstanding colleague, leader, mentor, and friend. She continues to play a key role in our recruitment of underrepresented students at the University of Georgia. One of her key accomplishments has been the significant role she played in the launching of our Road Dogs program, which takes UGA students across the state during spring break to promote a college-going culture in local high schools and encourage underrepresented students to consider the University of Georgia as their college of choice. Rosa, it has been a pleasure working with you in a number of capacities over the years. Your legacy will be the vast number of students, families, and alumni that have experienced UGA thanks to programs and events that you and your team have developed and implemented. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in congratulating Mrs. Rosa Driggers. Being a recipient of the President's Fulfilling the Dream Award is a true honor. It is a true honor for me, and it is an honor for my office, the Office of Undergraduate Admissions. It is a testament that we are serving the students of our state. And as I've always said, I'm always trying to be the person I wish I had in my corner when I was going through the college admissions process. As the Reverend Martin Luther King said, the time is always right to do what is right. And at UGA, this award for me means we are doing everything that we can to create a sense of belonging in Bulldog Nation. Our community awardee is a UGA alumnus who has dedicated his life to helping others in the Athens community. We could spend an entire day talking about his professional accomplishments as a journalist, including his support of Zebra Magazine, which has provided a platform for black communities across the state of Georgia. However, it is his work with young people that really sets him apart. In 2009, he created Education Matters, a radio show hosted by youth in our community where he assists the young people with all aspects of the radio show, including planning topics, inviting guests, and managing the radio booth. The effectiveness of his program is evidenced not only by the narrative of those of us who get to observe his good works, but there is data that supports his success. The program, it has seen a 96% graduation rate among program participants, with 83% of those going on to college and another 71% choosing journalism as a career. Achieving metrics like this, it is not surprising that he also served as a graduation coach for the Clark County School District, tasked with increasing system graduation rates among high school students. Among his many other accomplishments and community involvement, he is a member of the Athens Alumni Chapter of Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated. Our community awardee, is Richard Dunn Sr. Brother Dunn, thank you for dedicating your life to preparing the next generation of leaders. Your commitment to young people in this community is inspiring, and I know that it will go a long way in helping create a community that all of us can be proud of. I look forward to continuing the work that has already begun to create meaningful partnerships between Education Matters, the Grady College of Journalism, and the UGA Athletic Association. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in congratulating Mr. Richard Dunn, Sr. So growing up as a kid, uh, Dr. King was my hero. He was assassinated when I was 15 years old, and I remember the military taking over our school. I grew up in Washington, D.C., and the military was everywhere, and how sad I was that day uh, that he passed away. And I always wanted to live my life like my hero. So to get this 
award that honors him means a whole lot to me. Um, but it's not an award that I sought when I was doing my work. I sought to do what Dr. King said to do, which was serve others. And he said in his drum major for instinct uh, or, or speech, you know, don't, don't talk about all the awards that I got when I pass away. Talk about how I live to serve others. And that's what I'm trying to do. Honor him through my service. My favorite quote from Dr. King says, intelligence plus character, that is the goal of true education. It is my hope that the individuals recognized today will be living examples for each of us on how we can continue to live a life that emulates the hopes, values, and dreams of Dr. King, and that we would do so at this institution of higher learning, the birthplace of public higher education in America and reigning college football national champions in our local community and beyond. Thank you. And as always, go dogs. Good morning. My name is Matthew Brown and I'm a fourth year student athlete studying journalism and sports management here at the University of Georgia. I'm honored to introduce our very special keynote speaker for the 19th annual Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Freedom Breakfast, Dr. Arthur N. Dunnan. Dr. Dunnan began his distinguished career at the University of Alabama, where he received his bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees. While in school, he, along with a small group of student athletes, helped integrate Alabama's football team in 1967. This experience certainly had a major impact on the university and Dunnan himself, and no doubt served as a catalyst for his lifelong work in diversity and higher education. Throughout his nearly 35 year career in higher education, Dunnan served in many significant leadership roles, including Vice President for Public Service and Outreach at the University of Georgia, Dean of Graduate Studies and Sponsored Research at Kennesaw State University, Senior Vice Chancellor for Human and External Resources at the University System of Georgia, and Vice Chancellor for International Programs and Outreach for the University of Alabama System in Tuscaloosa. In 2013, Dunham was named Interim President of Albany State University and was then appointed President in 2015. During his tenure in 2017, Dunham led the merger of Albany State and HBCU with Darton State College, a historically white institution. Dr. Dunning wrote about the merger and experience in a 2021 publication, Unreconciled, Race, History, and Higher Education in the Deep South. Dunning's book provides a profound look into the community's reaction to the merger, unveiling long-held biases and beliefs of everyone involved. Unreconciled provides insight into how forward change in one community can have positive and last impacts throughout a nation. His recognitions and civic contributions are too numerous to mention, but just like Dr. MLK, Dr. Arthur N. Dunnan took his own footsteps of courage to become a true agent of change within his community and beyond, and in his wake has left a lasting legacy. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Arthur N. Dunnan. Matthew, thank you for that kind introduction. I'm delighted to be here at the University of Georgia. First of all, I'm I haven't seen my good friend Jerry Moorhead in a lot of years, but I'm also delighted to see Dr. Michelle Cook, who leads the Office of Institutional Diversity, a very complex job and a very needed job in this environment we're in today. I'm also pleased that athens Clark government, athens Clark schools, and the University of Georgia has really stayed the course on doing something that's so important to this community and indeed to this state. What I am most excited about is for us to take some time to reflect on the work of Dr. King over the years and what he has done to make this state and this nation a better place. This is a time for reflection. And one of the things that I think is important as we reflect on what we have done this past year, but also what we've done in the last 50 years, and I'm going to talk about that and give a period of time why I think something is happening in this country now that really uh, there was a 
a beginning point to explain all of this that's going on today. My experience has been deep and broad in this university and also in this state and in the state of Alabama. But I want to talk about MLK in a way that I've not thought about in a long time. I've had time to reflect on his work. He gave us a new way of looking at America. He also gave us some time in 1963, which I think is the is a tipping point for what we're seeing today. And I want to discuss in some ways how that impacted the life of this state and the life of this nation. What is important to me is that King used to use 1963 an awful lot. He would look back and say, we had about 350 years of some difficult times in this country. He was really putting together 250 years of American slavery and about 100 years of a Jim Crow system. In 1963, I want to mention four or five things that happened that really helped propel Dr. King to leadership at the national level and for us to think about him in many ways in this country forever. What was significant in 1963, for me, I was out of the country. I spent two years on the island of Taiwan. I was a teenager. And so I was able to look at what was happening in 1963 while I was out of the country. And the reason I tell you that is that I've read a lot of James Baldwin's work. Baldwin talked a lot about his time in Istanbul, his time in France, and his time in Paris. And, and uh, he had two times that he spent time in France, southern France and then Paris. And he explained in great detail how he could reflect on this nation being away from it. I really want to talk about that time in Taiwan, how I saw this nation as a teenager when I was out of it. Baldwin went to France in 1948, spent time in Paris, and 13 years later he went to Istanbul to finish another country and to finish the fire next time. And what he said, in so many ways, he felt free out of the country. He could be himself, he could think, be, and to do in ways that he could not do before. In a real sense, the first time I experienced freedom and liberty was in an island off the coast of China where I can move around freely. And to help you understand that, the first 18 years of my life was under the Jim Crow system. Why is that important? Because Martin Luther King looked at those 100 years and said it is time to dismantle that. When I first read what he was talking about when I was in Taiwan, he said there are two or three things we want to do. We want equality under the law. We must end the legal segregation and the Jim Crow system. We also want to end Jim Crow, not just the laws, but the policies, practices, and customs. I found that as a, as a young man fascinating. The other thing he said that caught the attention was the content of our character. He was really getting at this notion of this is no longer a place that should be tied around a racial caste system, that you should be judged by the content of your character, not by the color of your skin. That was sort of earth shattering for someone to say at the time. But what he did not mention, and this is something I've thought about over the years, is that we had these 350 years, but we did not do what the South Africans attempted to do, which is truth and reconciliation. After the Civil War, we ended it and said, good luck. After civil rights in 1964, the Civil Rights Bill ended it, but without any ability to think and to talk and to explain and to describe what had happened and why it had happened. So there was no remediation. If you go to Atlanta now, you will see a place called Atlantic Station. Several years ago, I was talking with the CEO of Atlantic Steel before they put Atlantic Station out there. And he said, the reason we have not done much on this land is because there's so many toxins under the ground that has to be cleaned up before we can put hotels, restaurants, grocery stores, and entertainments in this area. 
I often think about that story when I look at the 350 years that King talked about. We had no remediation. And so we're feeling some of the pains of that today. I'll use 1963 as a tipping point because that's when M.L. King really began to come to the forefront. In 1956, as a 26 year old, he had led the Montgomery boycott. He became the voice of it. But where he really, really moved to the forefront was in 1963. And I want to talk about some events that I saw when I was outside of the country that he got so engaged in. One was at the Kelly Ingram Park in Birmingham, Alabama. In May of 1963, a few thousand students from the Birmingham City Schools marched. And what was interesting to me, one day I walked into a, a shop in Taiwan, and this guy had become a good friend of mine. He had taught me how to use an abacus, and I was teaching him about English idioms. For example, someone said, it's raining cats and dogs outside. He said, what does that mean? I said, it's raining very hard. So I explained idioms to him. So we became good friends. And one of the things he had on his desk all the time was a, uh, a newspaper. And on the front page of this Taiwanese newspaper was the Kelly Ingram Park in Birmingham, Alabama, where the police dogs and the fire hoses were turned on these students. He asked me two or three questions, and I found it interesting that I had to explain this in ways that I had never thought about it before. He said, why is he using nonviolence? And what is he talking about on civil disobedience? So I explained Henry David Thoreau wrote a book about civil disobedience. I explained that Gandhi in India was able to change India using the same tactics, civil disobedience and nonviolence. I said they use the power of symbolism. They use symbolism in ways that had never been seen before as people who were trying to get free of oppression. And he said, why were they protesting? I said, they're protesting to end the Jim Crow system. The Jim Crow system in the South has gone on for a hundred years back in the U.S. He asked me the question, who is Jim Crow? And the question I thought about when he raised that question, I explained to him that Jim Crow was a character created by a man named Thomas Rice in the 1830s but it was a caricature of an African-American man who played a buffoon, but he blackened his face and he would dance and he would sing. I said, somehow in the 1880s or the latter part of the 1800s, this became tied to the laws, the Jim Crow laws. So I explained all of that. And then on June 11th, two students attempted to register at the University of Alabama, Vivian Malone and James Hood. And Governor Wallace stood in the door to block these students at Foster Auditorium, which was the gymnasium on that campus where registration was held. I did not know at the time that almost 36 months later, I would be out of service as a veteran going in that same building to register at the University of Alabama. That night, on June 12th, Medgar Evers was assassinated in Mississippi. His crime was to uh, register people to vote. But the reason I tell you this, on June 11th, Kennedy made a speech, John Kennedy after Wallace stood in the door, about civil rights. That was the first American president to talk about civil rights on a civil rights bill. And I had questions in Taiwan by some of the people there asking me about that speech and why was that so significant? I said, the United States president, his symbolism of a speech and his voice and his support was drastic in terms of making this move forward. And lastly, August 28th, Martin Luther King made one of the perhaps best speeches of the 20th century, I Have a Dream. He invoked, and I got a lot of questions about this from my good friend in Taiwan. He said, why did he use the U.S. Constitution, meaning Martin Luther King, in his speech? So I talked about the founders, how certain founders like Jefferson, Adams, Madison, and others were venerated 
So he used the voice of how this nation came into being through those men. The second thing he talked about is brotherhood, and he used the Bible. He said, why the Bible? I said, the Bible is the most sacred text in Western civilization. So as a Baptist preacher, and I explained to him, because Buddhism was what the religion was in Taiwan. I explained the Judeo-Christian heritage in this nation. So we kind of talked through all of that. But what King, where he caught the attention of almost everybody in that community over there, this notion of the content of our character. And they really wanted to get a sense of what was he talking about when he said that. I said, there's a racial caste system, especially in the South, around hereditary advantage, around the use of the Bible to talk about servant versus master. I said, what he was really getting at is how to make that change and using the sacred text and putting a different twist on the words that he used. And for me, it was kind of complicated to explain because I had not thought about it very much. Lastly, the 15th Street Baptist Church, where four girls were killed in September 1963, and one was blinded from the dynamite that was placed by the church. <clears throat> and that was perhaps my lowest time when I was out of the country. I was sad, angry, and there was a lot of tension on our small air station, United States Air Force Air Station. There was a lot of tension between African-American airmen and white airmen. What really caused me to pause about it, two weeks before the killings, Governor Wallace said the way we will stop civil rights in Alabama is to have a few more first-class funerals. Then that'll end all of this. And so two weeks later, those girls were killed. Perhaps the most signature event that happened in 63 that helped me understand what was going on back in the country, and it helps me today to know how deep some of the fault lines are, because we have some serious issues in our country today, is John Kennedy was assassinated. And I was asleep in my barracks, and a Taiwanese young man came in and touched me on the shoulder, said, wake up, wake up, the president is dead. He's been shot. I thought he was talking about Chiang Kai-shek. I said, was he in Taipei? He said, no, 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 the American president. And so I quickly got out of bed and I walked out in the hallway and there were two American airmen. One was from Morrow, Georgia and the other one was from Huntsville, Alabama. I will never get, forget their response. They were celebrating and cheering and clapping that Kennedy had been assassinated. They said, we got him, we got him. And that's when I knew this would not be easy. So what were, what were they celebrating about? Kennedy had made a speech supporting civil rights. They were angry about it, but what caught my attention, this was the command in chief, the United States president, and two airmen on foreign soil cheering the assassination of John Kennedy. So I sat down on my bed and thought about that. That's when I understood how deep some of the challenges we have. That's why Martin Luther King is so significant because he gave voice to what was wrong. He gave voice to people who had no voice. So this year, 2022, will be 58 years after the 1964 Civil Rights Act. So where are we? Martin Luther King gave us a path forward. He really gave us a blueprint of how to get along, how to think about each other, and how to live together. But as I look at what we are facing today, I have three or four questions in my mind, and I want you to think about them as well. The first question I have, are we living now in a post-truth society? Are we in a place where in this country that objective truth doesn't matter and empirical evidence doesn't matter, and that it is a period of time where we do no longer tell the truth. Are we in a post-truth society? That's a question I have. The other point I wish to make, 
We are a multiracial, multiethnic, and multireligious nation. And that will require certain approaches to living together. I submit to you generosity, restraint, and compassion will be the words that will be more effective and most effective for our type of country and what we're trying to accomplish. I would also suggest to you rage, anger, and resentment are not the words we'll use to solve these problems. So compassion, generation, and restraint versus rage, anger, and resentment. And do we have the ability to tell the truth? I mentioned earlier 350 years. There are almost no country in the world that does not have mythology. We have a lot of mythology in this country to the point where we wish to not talk about those 350 years. When someone tells you about their heritage, that means they're talking about their history, but not the bad things. So I would suggest to you, how can we learn to address what's often mythology about what happened versus the truth? Adams and Jefferson. Jefferson wrote some of the most elegant language about the Declaration of Independence and other of his writings. But Jefferson was a slave owner. And Jefferson also had an interesting relationship with a slave named Sally Hemings. So human beings are complicated. So there's the truth and there's mythology. How can we talk about both? I've been to a lot of places around the world and Usually I spend time with academics and they frequently talk about their country. And when they look to me, they say, Dr. Dunning, what makes you unique, the United States of America? I never fail to say orderly transfer of power and rule of law. I can tell you now, I'm worried about that. I'm worried about this in a way that I've never thought about it before. The last thing I'll finish with is, are we deeply now anti-science and anti-intellectual. When I was waiting to get on a bus to go to East Asia at a small railroad town, my dad had dropped me off at a little place called Thomasville, Alabama. George Wallace was out speaking. And Wallace was on the back of a flatbed truck. And this is where I first heard the anti-intellectual, anti-science. And he was saying to these working class people, and I had my duffel bag, my Air Force duffel bag, everything I owned in the world was in that duffel bag. And Wallace said, I want to tell you what's going on in Alabama. They're trying to tell us what to do. We have states' rights. All of these outsiders are trying to change us. Let me tell you who they are. The first one is that lying scalawag of a federal judge named Frank Johnson up there in Montgomery, Alabama. The rest are hippies, communists, Jews, and these liberal professors. They don't like your way of life in this state of Alabama. And they think they're better than you are, and they think they're smarter than you are. But I know you didn't go to school, but you just, your common sense equals to theirs. What he was saying, your opinion is just as valid as their expertise. So we're in a place today where I'm beginning to think in so many ways have we lost our ability to analyze, synthesize, and to reflect on a lot of information. So Dr. King, in his life, 39 years of age, he'd been, he was arrested 29 times, went to jail many times, assassinated at 39. What did this man do that we celebrate this breakfast this morning? He gave us a way forward. It's up to us at this point in time to look at this multiracial, multiethnic, and multireligious nation called the United States of America and try to figure out how we're going to make this experiment work. I'm delighted to be back on this campus. I have fond memories of this community and the University of Georgia. Thank you very much. Thank you for watching this year's presentation of the Martin Luther King Jr. Freedom Breakfast. Once again, we would like to thank Dr. Arthur Dunning for delivering the 2022 Freedom Breakfast keynote address. And a heartfelt congratulations to this year's Fulfilling the Dream Award winners. 
The Martin Luther King Jr. Freedom Breakfast would not be possible without the support of our sponsors, Athens Clark County Unified Government, AT&T, Clark County School District, Education Matters, Friends of Barrow Elementary, Georgia United Credit Union, Georgia Power, and Piedmont Athens Regional Hospital. We thank each of these entities for their support and for the many ways in which they contribute to our community. As we spend today reflecting on the significant steps that we are making towards positive change, we're wise to remember Dr. King's words, we cannot walk alone. He also said, change does not roll in on the wheels of inevitability, but comes through continuous struggle. So while we celebrate the diversity of our community, we must also recognize the perseverance and sacrifice of individuals like Dr. King, Dr. Dunning, and our award winners, as we continue working to build a more just and equitable society. In the year to come, let us be inspired by the commitment our award winners and speaker share with Dr. King in making our community more equitable and inclusive. And let us learn from them and from each other. That is how we will continue shaping the world that Dr. King envisioned for us all. Thank you for joining us for this year's Freedom Breakfast. Please stay tuned as we close when our vocalist, Mr. Rayvon Love, will sing The Impossible Dream. Have a great day. Unreachable star.